Welcome fellow Stardust. Are you ready for a scare? I see you've come back for more. If you're new here, buckle up. And thank you for joining me today. My name is DeRay, aka Rainbow Fright, lover of all things dark, creepy, and weird. Today's film review will be on slasher horror, Candyman. Helen. Yes? Helen. Who is that? This movie is a childhood favorite. I remember saying Candyman's name over and over again in bathrooms at school or at friends' houses, along with saying Rosemary's name. After that, we'd play some light as a feather, stiff as a board, and then tell some scary stories or watch scary movies. Those were my sleepovers. And here we have another movie like Blair Witch that is preying on the fascination and interest of urban legends. The term urban legend was first used in 1968, but was introduced to the public in 1981. It really became popular in the 90s when the public gained access to the internet. The internet made it easy for these stories to circulate and to be believed in by its audiences. A recent example of this would be Slenderman. Urban legends are told with the intent of making the listener believe that the story is true. Like a lot of folklore, these stories end up being cautionary tales for children or for anyone who might be in need of some guidance. So here is the summary and backstory of Candyman. Helen is a graduate student who is studying urban legends, and for her thesis, she is specifically researching Candyman, who she believes isn't real. In an effort to try to debunk his myth, she visits Cabrini Green, a public housing project near downtown Chicago, where a recent murder occurred and where people continue to perpetuate Candyman's legacy. The land these projects sit on is where Candyman died in the 1800s. Here, Helen sees paintings of Candyman and talks to one of the tenants, Anne Marie, who doesn't give her a lot of information. It's Helen's belief that the people living here use Candyman as a coping mechanism for everything they have gone through as a result of living in these projects, where cops have no control and crime is rampant. After learning Candyman's origin story, Helen goes back to Cabrini Green where she meets Jake and is attacked by some gang members, one of whom calls himself Candyman. After getting him locked up, she believes she has caught the killer responsible for the recent murder. However, since she has debunked the myth of Candyman, he must now return to Earth to reinstate his people's belief and fear of him. To do this, he must shed innocent blood. From here, she fights to get everyone to believe that he's real but winds up in a mental hospital after Candyman frames her for decapitating Anne-Marie's dog and kidnapping her baby, as well as killing her best friend, Bernadette. After she summons Candyman to her doctor's office, we get one of the best kill scenes ever, and Helen manages to escape. She returns to Cabrini Green and takes a closer look at the paintings on the walls. Candyman has left her a message that says, it was always you, Helen. And then she sees a painting of a woman that looks like her. The woman in the painting is that of who Candyman fell in love with and is the reason he died a horrible death. Believing she is the reincarnation of his lover, Candyman is now offering Helen immortality to be with him forever. After she comes to from her trance-like state, she realizes that Candyman has put Anne-Marie's baby in the pile of garbage outside and tended for a bonfire for a block party. Jake only sees the hook as she enters the pile to save baby Anthony, so he rounds up the rest of the kids to set fire to the rubble in order to kill Candyman. Helen is successful at both killing Candyman and saving Anthony, but her burns are too severe and she dies. After her funeral, feeling guilty, her husband Trevor says her name five times in the mirror. She pops up like Candyman and guts him from groin to gullet. The torch, or hook, 
has now been passed to her. Candyman was born Daniel Robitaille in the 1800s. His father was a slave who became wealthy after inventing a machine that allowed for the mass production of shoes during the Civil War. His father was able to send him to all the best schools and Daniel became a renowned painter who would be often commissioned to paint the portraits of wealthy white people. For one particular commission, he was to paint the daughter of a wealthy landowner who wanted to capture her virginal beauty. She and Daniel ended up falling in love and she became pregnant. Infuriated, her father hired a lynch mob to kill Daniel. When they captured him, they severed off his right hand, covered him in honey, and watched him die as bees stung him to death. While watching him die, the kids dubbed him Candyman. His soul cannot rest. He thrives on the fear of people who believe that he will come through their bathroom window and gut them. If people start to question his existence, he returns to earth to remind them that he is in fact real. Let me know in the comment section if you've ever said Candyman's name five times in the mirror. This is an adaptation of Clive Barker's short story, The Forbidden, from the Books of Blood. The story originally takes place in Liverpool, England, and is a commentary on the class system. English director Bernard Rose wanted to change the setting to the projects in Chicago and wanted to shift the focus to the class system in America. Cabrini Green was an actual housing project in Chicago known for its high crime rate, a place that cops had no control over. The scenes that take place at Cabrini Green are shot on location. Virginia Madsen, who plays Helen, and Tony Todd, who plays Candyman, were escorted by plainclothes officers when they were checking out the location before filming began. Bernard even hired some of the local gang members to be extras in the film. Everything else was shot in sound studios in LA. What makes this story stand out from other slasher films is this sense of romanticizing death, sort of like Edgar Allan Poe. We have this monster who has suffered through tragedy and oppression, and he doesn't necessarily want revenge, he just wants love and to be remembered. In essence, the true history of America is incapable of being erased because once you start to doubt it, it would be thrown in your face. You know how there's some people who don't believe that the Holocaust happened? Well, this would be like Anne Frank coming from their attics and stabbing them in the eye with her pen. Instead of a cold-blooded killer, we have a sad soul who we learn later in the film just misses his lover. Virginia and Tony went to waltz and fencing classes so that way they would be more easily able to portray a sense of romanticism between the two of them. And instead of screaming like a banshee like most people do in slasher films, when Helen saw Candyman, she was in a trance-like state. Helen's eyes are drastically different compared to the rest of the film, and that is because in these moments, she is actually hypnotized. Bernard hired a hypnotist who taught him how to put Virginia under with just a keyword. So every time we have Candyman and Helen on screen together, before taking the shot, Bernard would take about 10 minutes to cast her under his spell. Virginia says that she would never do something like this again, but that she absolutely loved everything about making Candyman. And when she's under, she is so captivating, and her stare makes you lock in, and it's hard to look away. Just as captivating, if not more, is Candyman. Seeing his full form 44 minutes into the film takes your breath away, along with hearing his voice that reverberates throughout your entire body. Helen, I came for you. Do I know you? No. No. But you doubted me. I'm sorry, I have to go. His presence is daunting, but there is always this sense of sorrow. 
This sadness mixed with horror really emphasizes the gothic nature of this story. Also in this scene, you don't hear Candyman's footsteps in a parking garage where normally they would echo. This is likely to drive home the fact that he isn't human. This introduction to Candyman and the events that follow it turn this film into a psychological thriller. This look in her eye is the same look when she hears the origin story of Candyman from Professor Purcell. It's as if to say she was instantly connected to Candyman in a way that she was unaware of. So learning later on that he believes that she is the reincarnate of his lover makes sense. So this idea of people coming through medicine cabinets to murder people was an actual problem that people faced. And on top of that, at four years old, Clive Barker's grandmother would tell him to be careful in public bathrooms because there were people there who were wanting to cut off his genitalia. Needless to say, that stuck with him forever. And the scene where Candyman busts through Helen's medicine cabinet was unplanned. Virginia didn't know that it was coming. Tony Todd actually refused to do this at first because he didn't want to scare her that badly, but he finally gave in and agreed to do it. So the terror and fear you see on her face is real. And speaking of real, the bees were real as well. And if you love bees as much as I do, you'll be happy to know that the ASPCA was on set the entire time, making sure that the 200,000 bees were taken care of. For Helen's scene with the bees, the bee handler used bees that were under 12 years old. That way they couldn't fly and were less likely to sting her. Virginia only had to worry about the baby bees, but Tony had to deal with both the grown bees and the baby bees. So he ended up getting stung 23 times, but his lawyer was able to work out a deal where he got $1,000 per bee sting. And because Virginia was allergic, there was an ambulance on standby just in case they needed to treat her. At first glance, this story might seem like it's perpetuating a negative narrative about inner city projects and the black man being a threat to the white woman. But I think the writing is respectful and raw when talking about the circumstances of people of color from the past and the present. Bernard even had meetings with the NAACP to make sure he wasn't being insensitive. They essentially scoffed at him and asked why they were even having this meeting. They said, of course, we would like to see a black Freddy Krueger or Hannibal Lecter. And like a lot of allies in real life, we have this white woman who is going into a world that she knows nothing about and is trying to save the people there without listening to them or believing in what they have to say. But again, this is written in such a careful way that we instead feel that the history is being honored instead of mocked. I was surprised that Bernard Rose didn't write and direct the second and third films. He actually did write a script for the second film, but it was rejected. I'm so crazy excited for next month. I'm excited to see what Jordan Peele has done. He wrote the script and Nia DaCosta directed the film. It's going to be a direct continuation from the first film, so that makes me even more excited. One last fun fact about the making of this film, Bernard wanted Virginia to be a little bit more round, so to prepare for her role, she ate a ton of pizza. Man, I would love to be paid to eat a ton of pizza. With only three kills in the entire movie and only one of them being on camera, this movie does an amazing job of instilling a fear in us while also having us sympathize with the antagonist. I really hope that we get another psychological slasher next month. This film, although known by many, is wildly unappreciated. So I'm hoping this reboot gives it the recognition that it deserves. You can probably guess that I'm gonna give this one five rainbow skulls. It's just pure perfection.
Well, thank you again for joining me today, fellow Stardust. I appreciate you being here with me. I hope I see you next Thursday when I have another horror film review. And I'll be uploading another True Crime and Nails episode this weekend. And right now I'm playing around with the times, so just keep an eye out for it. So, if you haven't already, go ahead and hop on the Rainbow Fright Freight Train and hit that subscribe button along with the notification bell. That way you'll get notified every time I upload a video. I'll see you next time. Peace. Game.